by early in, uh, in early forties of his, he started the Infinity Foundation and really immersed himself in the study of the Dharmic tradition and putting 8, 10, 12, 14 hours of work in really uh, deeply getting a grasp of all the intricacies and complexities of the field and has done enormous amount of not only supporting various projects but his own scholarly work. Um, Raji has been a, has been keen on bringing about a change in the terms of discourse. Uh, he stands for a contemplative intellectualism leading to a game change. He has put many of the scholars in the academy whose entire hierarchic stance used to go unchallenged like Wendy Daninger on a defense. His series of dialogue with leftist uh, academicians like Vijay Prasad in Outlook magazine has been quite noteworthy. At times, his use of business or corporate idiom are evocative. Thus, he draws parallels between a local franchise of McDonald's in India not being treated as a minority entity, but as a part of a powerful global multinational uh, uh, enterprise. Similarly, an evangelical church operating in a tribal area of India need not be treated as a minority institution with all the attendant privileges currently being conferred by the Indian state, but as a branch office of an international powerful strategic religious enterprise. So which is a very interesting way of looking at uh, the minority majority issue in the Indian context. He is currently involved in writing a series of books summarizing his intense study of the last over a decade of uh, time on a range of civilizational themes which are extensively researched and civilizationally conceptualized and have a great potential to become thought-provoking, ground-breaking and history-making type of pioneering scholarship. A couple of books I had a chance to recently review and I was quite uh, uh, impressed and struck by the sheer depth and the breadth of uh, his writing. In nutshell, what are some of the salient features of Rajiv's intellectual work? His central vision shows upon uh, or draws upon the core principles of dharma tradition to provide fresh approach to engagement and perspectives on current conflicts between competing civilizational paradigms and worldviews. That he wishes to define and develop a level playing field of encounter between East and West in Kurukshetra. Kurukshetra is an analogy drawn from the Indian epic Mahabharata is conventionally trans translated to mean a military battlefield. However, Rajiv expands the idea to mean an intellectual battlefield that he has been striving first as his own deep inquiry about the differences and similarities and then a productive engagement and encounter between dharma and the other prevailing paradigms including the West and the Judaic Christian tradition. Raju argues that up till now, the exchange between dharma and the West has been stultified by unproductive attitude and assumption on both sides. Thus, on the Western side, there has been an assumption that each paradigm ought to be universal and that all other points of view and other so societies be mapped on a set of categories that emerge primarily from the Western synthesis of classical Greek philosophy and Abrahamic religions. And whatever results, whatever resists this process tends to evoke great anxiety and even violence. On the Dharmic side also, there is a tendency not to critically study and engage the depth of Western thought, either dismissively or arrogantly, and to superficially proclaim a false unity of sameness, Raju proposes new principles for multi-civilizational encounter. I would like to briefly conclude in closing on the present topic of the, this decolonizing the Indian studies, I will just share two thoughts. Any country under foreign rule has to achieve independence at two important levels, outer and inner. The outer will consist of political, economic emancipation. The inner, obviously, both foundational and central, consists of psychological, spiritual, and civilizational decolonizing. I will see the current conference as one important such vitally needed step towards completion of this process. Uh,
in back. So uh, I, I just uh, make one concluding para. Uh, in my understanding of Rajiv, what also struck me is he would not only talk about the process of decolonizing from the influence of well-known historical figures such as Max Muller, William Moore, and Lord Macaulay, but how in many subtle and disguised ways even many contemporary scholars continue to participate either deliberately or inadvertently the colonizing of civilization and mind. I will ask Rajiv to uh, share his talk. is very important 
in resolving an issue. Is it the jurisdiction of the United States laws uh, or the laws of uh, China in the event of a dispute? Where are we going to fight? That language, that terminology, or what you may call hermeneutics, or the terms of dialogue, and debate, and who are the powers to be that will be referees, that will make all the difference in how the case is settled. So the same is true in the, in, in, if you lose your categories, if you lose the categories and the, the, the basic ideas in which you think of your tradition, if you lose those because, the other, because there is a more powerful tradition, there is a more power, they control the academy, they control the media, and, they, and we have to be sucking up to them, uh, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, to uh, get into their system, otherwise they'll ignore us. If we have to uh, be heard only in the way they like, they, they can understand, then, and, and the price we are paying is loss of our own categories, that is the ultimate loss of sovereignty. And, and the, a good counter example to this is Gandhi, who basically stuck to his categories, his, his, a few terms he would not translate, you know, Swadhyay, Swaraj, uh, Satyagraha, Swadharma, I mean, he did, it didn't matter, it's not that in front of Indians he was talking like that, but he, when he was in Britain he would be talking like some uh, Anglo, as, you know, philosopher or talking about some enlightenment theory. No, he was always true to who he was, no matter where. And he wasn't playing this game that in this audience I'll say this and in that audience I'll say that, because in the end it doesn't work. So this uh, demand that he would stick to his categories was a very, very uh, important part of what uh, Gandhi was all about whether you believe in his particular policies or not, you have to acknowledge that he played a very important role in sticking to the, the dharmic categories. The, uh, the, the uh, <coughs> discourse, we've heard a lot about uh, contesting the discourse as decolonizing. But I would submit to you that there is a more, there's a deeper and more important uh, de decolonizing that is needed which has to do with understanding the mechanisms by which the discourse has been created, that is sustained, that is, it is distributed. The mechanisms include funding mechanisms, it includes uh, who are the producers of knowledge and uh, what are the ground rules, the hermeneutics, the categories in which they have to do their work. Uh, how is this transmitted to uh, media and to education systems and policy makers? This whole mechanism uh, it itself has to be encountered, has to be confronted. And in this room, I know that Shiva Bajpi has uh, confronted the California textbook as a mechanism. It's an actual living mechanism today, uh, which is present in most of the states. And he has the experience of going and encountering and confronting them. And I also know that uh, Ramdas Lab has had a few such encounters with mechanisms that are basically colonized mechanisms including a lot of Indians were colonized, which is actually the bigger problem now these days. So, uh, if you haven't done that, and if you are sort of uh, criticizing, uh, either from, uh, either criticizing dead scholars, it's easy to criticize dead scholars, you can criticize the 19th century colonialists because they're not going to come back and haunt you. Uh, you. It's more difficult to criticize the living scholar in Chicago or in Harvard or in wherever they are because they're going to affect your career. But if you are afraid to do that, and you can hide behind all the jargon and all this fancy stuff, but you are really afraid to take on the mechanism that is living mechanism today, and you want to therefore, uh, uh, you know, sort of sidetrack the whole discussion by criticizing the dead empire. You know, the dead empire, the dead foundations, the dead institutions, the dead scholars, I mean, that is a bit of a cop-out, which I think uh, a lot of the decolonizers are doing. It's a, it's a good escape mechanism. Uh, there's also uh, a tendency to criticize by being in a manner that is so abstract that hardly anybody understands. And you hope that the person who's spoken understands. Uh, and, and, and in a sense it's irrelevant. because It's irrelevant because it doesn't have the direct hit. It's not direct enough and it's not actionable uh, and it's too abstract. There is another problem in the, in the academy that the, uh, there are taboos of what you cannot say in the academy, what you cannot say. Uh, one of the projects that we did in the foundation some five, six years ago 
is that there is a South Asian Studies Conference in Madison every year for the last 35 years. So we approached them and said we'd like to get all your proceedings. So they thought it was very unusual because nobody has asked for all the proceedings. Usually you ask for one or two years. So they said, why, why do you need all the proceedings? Uh, all those years. So we said well, we want to go through them, analyze them, and, and write a report. And they were very reluctant to sell, although their website said for so many dollars you can buy particular years proceedings. So that we have managed through indirect means to gather 33 years of proceedings out of 35. And then I hired some students from Princeton University to scan all these. Each year it's got four, five, six hundred papers, so it's a lot of paper, you know, suitcases full of paper. Scan all that and make a searchable database so we could look for patterns. And we produced an analysis which we've never published on what cannot be said in the academy. For example, if you take a category of problems facing women in South Asian studies, about 95% of the examples are in Hindu. Hardly ever an Islamic case study of women's problems. As though Islamic women don't have problems in, in Islamic society. And mind you, this is South Asian studies, so it includes Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh. And even after 9-11, hardly any uh, analysis of uh, the plight of women in Taliban. There are topics that are off limits. We can't uh, introduce those topics because the, the, uh, the, the people who are in charge of that mechanism, uh, they have a certain ideological framework. There are some sacred things you can't touch. And so this is an example of, uh, of, of that. We also did a study of how at Harvard, India and China compare. This is another thing that nobody has done. Uh, I, I, I had an opportunity to meet some of the big shots in Harvard who were raising tons of millions of dollars from Indian donors. So I was invited by one of them to uh, ask uh, to, to be present. And uh, I, you know, sometimes you have to be a spoiler because that, that is an honest function you have to do. So I asked these people that, you know, have you looked at uh, the, the way Harvard studies India, before you donate all this money for India studies, have you looked at how Harvard studies India versus how it studies China? And none of them had thought about it, and the, the guys who were promoting South Asian studies had not thought about it. So I presented to them a few highlights. Uh, China studies is not, the, the excludes, I mean, I'm not talking about extracurricular talks in the evening where some activists may come and all that, but I'm talking in the actual curriculum. They talk about their high culture, they talk about their ancient great history, they talk about their industry, all of that stuff. They do not talk about controversial issues like Tibet and human rights violations in the actual, in the actual curriculum itself. Uh, in India, that is the dominant discourse. The dominant discourse in the South Asian studies has been on the human rights nightmare that India is. So when I showed this to uh, a group of uh, visitors who were, this is about uh, the, many years ago, who were representing a major industrialist that was supposed to give them a $25 million check. So he said, I'm going to go back and say, don't give them even one dollar. So, of course, I got the blame for being a spoiler. But I, I, I challenge the Harvard guys that you should, uh, you should compare India and China, how you're treating, how much criticism, how much uh, what you're doing. And the Chinese, st the China studies all the time. The Chinese ambassador is a great guy, and the Chinese government people come. And the reason China studies managed to become, uh, remain, uh, you know, uh, uh, under their control is they control the visas. Western scholars, very carefully they control the visas. And if you're blacklisted, no, no, no way. And India not only is pretty open, which is, I, I prefer that, but also India thinks that being the object of study is a compliment for us, that if somebody's studying us, it's good news. The more we get studied, the better. Uh, without looking at what exactly they're studying, what exactly is their, uh, their agenda, what is their output, and how they're using it, there's nobody in the Indian government who's bothered, no analysis of how we have been studied over time, and how are we being studied now, and what is its implication to the nation. Nothing like that. I also did a project to review 50 years of Ford Foundation in India, which I think is an is a instrument of colonization, of how it is studied, what kind of grants it gives, and what kind of uh, human rights empowerments in the rural areas it's creating. So I went to their office uh, in Delhi, right next to the India International Center, and uh, big, huge walls, you know, tough to get in and all that. But I knew some people, and I said, you know, I'd like to see your library where you have all your reports. And usually, 
you know, if you are a sponsor of research, you have a room where you kept all your, all your output. And they said, we got no such thing. So I was surprised. I thought maybe I need special permission. I have to be an important guy. So I got some important people to make some phone calls for me. And they came back and said that this is actually true, that in, in India, Ford Foundation does not keep copies of its reports on India, which is very strange that these reports are done and they have put over $1 billion, $1 billion of grants in India, Port Foundation. Uh, and they very proudly list how much money they're doing and what not. But where's the output? I mean, you've got to evaluate them not based on some uh, their own self-advertising, but some independent people have to be able to come and evaluate what they're producing. So finally, I got through uh, people in New York and various other places, bits here and there, of some examples and some, some idea of the patterns of their grant making. And based on that, I, I've uh, done some evaluation uh, and, and I concluded that the Port Foundation is not transparent because it is not open to scrutiny and the Indian government and Indian uh, uh, thinkers and scholars have had no interest. I was the first guy who even wanted to see all this stuff. Nobody else thought it was even interesting to go to this biggest foundation that operates in India and find out well, what do you do and what have you what have you concluded about our country and what uh, you know can we understand it and can we can we critique it so these are some of the some of the issues that uh, uh, I, I, I am concerned about and I study uh, a question on what is colonization uh, people have assumed that colonization is what sort of British did in India and the assumption is that there is a there is a kind of an original Indian state, uh, and then the British came and contaminated it by inserting some uh, colonial things, and the decolonization therefore means we get rid of that. I think this issue itself has to be discussed whether it is as simple as that. I mean, uh, I, I claim that uh, the Islamic colonization is a very serious kind of colonization. Uh, during the Mughal time, Persian was imposed as the court language. Uh, you know. Was, uh, and the, there was a huge impact on the uh, thinking uh, of uh, Hindus in India. You go to the border states, uh, Punjab and uh, uh, you know, Rajasthan, and women wear veils. It's all a parda influence to comply. It's the same kind of mindset that says, well, let's have uh, Judeo Christian hermeneutics so that they will accept us and we can relate to them better. It's the same kind of mindset that said, you know, we, we don't want to wear burqa, but we'll wear parda, we'll be, we'll be less different, we'll become more or less similar to them, and they will accept us. It is the anxiety of, refu of reducing my difference from the dominant culture, taking the burden on myself to become like them. So upward mimicry to be like them, so that they will maybe accept me more. And this uh, colonized uh, uh, Islamic influence has had a very big impact in the form of an Islamic caste system. Many of you might not think of Islam having a caste system, but if you just Google Ashraf and Ajlaf, these are the upper caste and lower caste. Ashraf, uh, Ashraf means uh, the four kinds of Ashraf. Uh, those who are said to be Saeeds are direct de descendants of the Prophet. And those who are Sheikhs are other Arabs, other Arab elites. These are people in India who are considered said to be of that origin. And then Turks are Turkish origin, and Pashtuns who are Iranian, Persian, Pashtun origin. These are the four upper castes. And then Ajlaf are natives who got converted. So while theoretically Islam has no caste system and no ethnic divide, uh, you know, between superior and inferior, theoretically that is the case. But the work, the, but the fact that there is Ashraf versus Ajlaf, huge disparity and litigation and, and fights going on. There is a movement called, uh, there's a whole caste system uh, fight with by the Ajlafs fighting lawsuits in Indian courts against the Ashraf saying that they keep all the prestigious positions and they take all the money that is given to minorities and they keep it to themselves. So this Ashraf versus Ajlaf is a kind of a colonial byproduct because those who came from the west of India uh, whether it is uh, Arabia, Persia, Turkey, uh, sort of they were sort of equivalent of the British, you know, in India. And like the Anglo-Indians considered a little more superior to the rest of the Indians. So those Indians who were classified as Ashraf, having that origin, were superior caste. 
So now there's no DNA testing in those days. So anybody who could change his name and uh, imagine a certain history that, you know, my, my ancestors came from Persia. I know a lot of Pakistanis in Princeton who all think that their ancestors came from Persia or Turkey or somewhere like that. And I asked them to go and have a DNA test and they'd probably be more like the Indian. But they don't, they can't. Uh, so it's a kind of an imagined history. They've given themselves an imagined history of the superior uh, people in order to feel that, you know, we are part of the global na historical narrative of that place where the whole story took place. And then, and so this, so they're not really Indians as such. And this <coughs> Ashrafization of the native Muslims, Ashrafization is sort of like they accuse uh, Hindus of doing Sanskritization. Exactly. That you're Sanskritizing the tribals and there is hegemony and all that. And Sanskritization is now considered a form of colonization by the Marxists, by the left. Sanskritization is considered their idea of colonization and their idea of decolonization is to desanskritize and give rights to subalterns and to overturn <coughs> what they consider to be Brahmanical hegemony. So even what is colonization and decolonization is contested. It, it is not as simple as British are the colonizers and Indians are the colonized. It is also the, the dominant view in the academy, in the liberal left academy in South Asian studies here and in, in India is that the, uh, the, the colonizers are these uh, Sanskritized people, Sanskrit people and Brahmanical people and the colonized are the subalterns and the real Indians and the, the, the Dalits and these kind of people and in terms of North South it's the Aryans who colonize the Dravidians and the Dravidians are fighting back. So if you were to just go and say we are decolonizing, uh, if you were to go around asking people hey we are decolonizing what do you think, a lot of people will say yeah that's very good I also want to decolonize. And unless you do the due diligence of going deep and asking what exactly you mean by who's the colonizer and who's the colonized and what does decolonization mean, unless you go through that, you will not know what exactly they're referring to. So a lot of this so-called post-colonial studies, which is to, uh, trying to decolonize, is not empowering dharmic uh, culture at all. It is, it is disabusing, the, uh, it is kind of undermining dharmic culture as the colonizer and uh, try to uh, empower the, the subaltern people or the people they feel who have been oppressed by the army culture. So there is a context of that kind. And in that contestation of who are the colonizers, I'm introducing a new discourse saying that the Ashraf have colonized the Ajlaf, is within Islam. And this, this has a lot to do with the Urduization. In, uh, uh, in Kerala, uh, until recently, I mean, people of my age will tell you that they grew up in a Malayali school, Muslims. Muslims will say that we are first Malayali and then we are Muslim. That is their identity. But Malayali schools are being replaced with Urdu schools. And when they Urduize the Malayali, they also give them a new sense of history. The kid gets a sense of history that we are part of this pan-Islamic group and we are all one and we came from somewhere. And so the, the, the nativity, the, 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 the sense of... Uh, ancestry that it belongs to the soil is gone. I saw this in Indonesia when I, I used to own a company there 15 years ago. And in Indonesia I found that they all had like Hindu names, you know, Ram and Sita, and they all very, they're not talking like their body language and their ways were very, very Hindu. Their language is called Bahasa. So I had a lot of discussion with uh, people who were there. They were Muslims. All the people that worked for me were Muslim people with Hindu demeanor and culture and lifestyle and names and all that. And one of the uh, professors there who, who became a friend of mine, he said to me that the problem of Ashrafization in their culture has to do with those who are sent on the Hajj pilgrimage. Are they really do a number on them for a month, they brainwash them and say, no, 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 you're not native, you are part of us only. They give a new identity, come these guys come back and they wear different clothes and they got a different name. It's no longer a Sanskrit name like they used to have. So the, the Ashrafization of the Indonesian is going on in a very big way with a lot of Saudi money. And this kind of person comes back and wants to create trouble. This is the kind of person who comes back and he no longer relates to his neighbors who, are, who see themselves as native Indonesians, Bahasa people, and he sees them, himself as different from them and a bit of tension develops. So this is not... Uh, the tensions in India, which have not been studied, is the colonial tension of Ashraf versus Ajlaf within the Islamic community. This is something that our people have just not uh, paid much uh, attention to. 
I would also say another dimension in understanding colonization in India is regional. Uh, the Punjab experience is different from Bengal experience, the Maharashtra experience is different, Tamil Nadu is different. So you find that the, the colonial history of who got colonized, how a region got colonized, who were the people who colonized, and what was the exact impact, how deep was that impact, uh, needs, it needs to be studied on a regional level. So even the decolonization is not a sort of a generic, you know, one for everybody. It's a, it's a very specific kind of decolonization depending on the effect that uh, each, uh, each place had. One of the uh, uh, one of the issues that faces uh, academic people wanting to decolonize, which uh, and I feel that they will not be able to decolonize. I, I don't think the academic people in the humanities, those who are like Ram Singh and Subhash Khan, not in the humanities, they, they, are, they, can do, they can say anything they want and do whatever they want, they can be very courageous. But those who are in the humanities, with a few rare exceptions, like the couple of examples I gave, you know, where Ram Das says he doesn't mind, he'll stand up and take whatever he comes to say. But that's very rare. And I know uh, uh, Professor Mandir has been doing that for Sikhism and taking a lot of heat. But by and large, uh, most people are not going to be successful. It will be nice talk, it will be a nice fashionable thing to say, we will go to some gathering and give a talk and be very good, you know, we are doing this now, decolonization, it's a nice thing to say. But I, I, I feel that it is, not, uh, it is not a likely outcome, given the demeanor, given, of the, of the, of, uh, given the amount by which they are colonized already. By, by the, because to, to make it into the academy, you go through a process of complicity and compliance for so long that you're think you become kind of colonized. And you become, you, you are obliged to this very system that you are trying to, you are supposed to undermine, but you become part of it. Sort of like what the British did very successfully with a lot of Indians. That kind of a mindset continues. Recently, my friend Dr. Shinde, in a visit to some academic people in the humanities, made an interesting observation to me, saying that, you know, I came across a lot of uh, good uh, scholars who are good Dharmic people in the humanities, and they said, you know, we are not supposed to be political or activists. This is the problem. We are not supposed to be political or activists. Now, this is a very good uh, way to diffuse the, the potential of protest. So I pointed out that, uh, you know, recently, when the Ayodhya uh, judgment came out from the High Court, Ramila Thapar wrote a very political and a very activist uh, piece, and she is a great scholar, big scholar, big name scholar. And when the California textbook thing was going on, 150 well-established academic scholars wrote a very, very, very political uh, activist intervention talking about all kinds of political things. And when this Ekal Vidyale uh, was attacked because it was having success in counteracting missionary activity in the tribes, and they couldn't stand it that now Hindus got their own uh, school in the tribe uh, to compete against the Krishna missionary school. So the whole left wing uh, led by Vijay Prasad, whom I then had a big debate with, they came up with this big attack. It was uh, supported by hundreds of uh, South Asian scholars. So I don't really accept this as a valid uh, position that, you know, we the scholars, you know, we can't be activists, you know, oh, no, 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 we can't be the activists. I take it as a cop-out. Because when it's time to attack Hinduism, then a whole lot of scholars are in, in lined up very publicly. Uh, Martha Nussbaum wrote, has been writing many, many books attacking all these Hindu things, and I have the, the, distinct, the distinction of being uh, of a whole chapter being devoted on me in one of her, one of her books. Uh, so they have no qualms about this activism and politicizing their position in the academy. Uh, but somehow Hindus have been told that you know you stay below the glass ceiling and you kind of behave yourself and you mean that nobody will notice you. And you quietly live your days, and you know you keep writing your articles and show up in your resume, and we'll include you in this committee. And your article will show up in that journal, and don't don't make trouble. So this business of don't make trouble, kind of I call it domestication. It, it, you know the system is very good at domesticating the threat. You domestic you take this threatening thing and you domesticate it to a pet, and this pet, the Indian or Hindu scholar, as a pet in the academy a kind of uh, non-threatening, he's kind of quaint, he's cute, he'll do some treats when you give him some, he'll do some tricks for you. Uh, he knows his limits, and he's always looking up to the master. Uh, and this is a very, very nice one to develop, to nurture, to encourage more such people, make them into role models, so that others will follow like that. 
and build them up and say, okay, this is a good guy. We, he should be called for a talk. We give him a seminar. We'll invite him because he's a good one, you know, because we want to set a good example. So I say, I think that we've fallen, we've gone too far down this path, and I'm not too uh, convinced that uh, we can <coughs> change things uh, fast enough. This is all about remaining below the radar. Uh, this is all about uh, making sure that you are irrelevant and you cannot be strong enough to change the game. And my question to people is, are you in the business of changing the game or just writing another paper? Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I, a good friend of mine uh, uh, in LA, he's, a, he's, a, he's created a big chair in UCLA for Indian history. And uh, he got a good, well-known uh, Indian historian you know, who's very pro-India uh, dharma and tradition to occupy the chair. So when I was uh, visiting, uh, uh, I think around five years ago, this gentleman invited me to dinner with uh, this Indian historian and wanted to introduce us. So we're sitting at this Chinese restaurant and just uh, eating those chips, waiting for the menu. So they start by saying that, you know, um, we've heard that we know about you, we like what you're doing, but you know, our style is different. And our style is we don't want to uh, confront, make trouble, but we're doing good positive things, and this is our style. So I said, well, very good, I want to learn. I would like to learn. So uh, what I asked this uh, history professor is, uh, he was about <coughs> to retire at that time. So I said, you've been, is it time to go for it? Uh, no, the Indian, Indian history chair. You, you know the guy. Okay. Bala, Bala. Bala. But, but anyway. I don't want to know. Okay. So I, I asked him a question. I said, you've been in this field for 40 years. Uh, tell me a single discourse where you've changed the discourse on Indian history because of you. Huh? Or where you've been a game changer. Or where, uh, because of you, the prevailing view is different. I mean, it could be on the Aryan issue. It could be on a caste issue. It could be on um, the, the relationship, whether Hindu, Buddhism, what, whatever the history was between them. You pick any issue. I'm not saying it has to be a particular topic. On any issue of India or Indian civilization or dharma, have you made an impact such that you can say because that, that is my signature with which I'm leaving the academy, that's the impact I've made. It dumbfounded him. He never thought this way. So he just quiet for a while. And then, then he was very honest. And he said, you know, I cannot say that I have had that kind. So then I looked at a gentleman who's a sponsor. He's a great real estate uh, builder. So I said, when you took me around LA, you didn't say you didn't say that uh, I had this dinner, I had this party, because this uh, historian was explaining his career in those terms that I gave a talk there, and they all applauded me. And then I, I they wrote me a letter saying that you've done a great job. And then an article appeared here, and then I was invited to be in that committee. Why he had done all those things? At the end of the day, there was not a single game-changing discourse because of him. So I, what I'd ask this uh, real estate uh, gentleman is that your career in real estate, you would not describe in terms of I had a meeting in, with, this, uh, with the mayor and I had a meeting with this engineering company. You would go me around saying that building I made, that big uh, plaza, I did. That big uh, thing developed, I did. So it is the concrete output which you are showing me as the consequence of your career. So that's the consequence I want to see in the academic guy that you sponsor. And, and so while the method of being very nice is a good method, but I'd like to see some results. So that impact game changing, uh, I did not, uh, did not see. So I, I see this uh, a whole lot of domestication I, I talked about. Uh, and there is, a, there is a blacklisting system that if you are really a troublemaker, who speaks out loudly, you get blacklisted. And, and then you, you will not be invited. In fact, if there's a, even if you are a major contributor, and even if you've done very original work, even something on decolonizing, for example, and if there's a conference like that going on, you will not be invited because it looks bad to have association with you in public. But privately, it will be like, you know, you're a really important guy, we like you and this and that. I know Shiv Bhajpai, what he's, uh, he's laughing because he relate to this. This is, this is the game, that how it is played. And, our people are colonized when they become complicit and <laughs> compliant with this kind of a demand which is being made. Rather than being able to say that, look, I make my own evaluations. So then let's come to the question of adhikar. And this is an important issue uh, that uh, needs to be discussed. Who has adhikar 
to speak uh, for dharma. Uh, in our tradition, uh, the adhikar is nothing to do with a western style degree or a western accreditation that you are qualified. In our tradition, the, first, the, the guru who has achieved an embodied experience and is not uh, required to recite uh, the, the fact that he has some theoretical knowledge or that he has passed a theoretical or got a diploma from some place to have adhikar. He is the guy who's got adhikar because he has embodied this experience. So there is a big difference between the text-based uh, traditions where hermeneutics and uh, all these different uh, approaches to studying that we, were, we mentioned uh, in uh, Rita's very, very nice con uh, talk. All these are approaches to what I call disembodied uh, path of, uh, of, un uh, of advancement, which has to do with text. So you study text, you study history of dead people, dead, dead uh, long things that happened uh, thousands of or hundreds of years ago. You study them and you master them and you interpret them and that's something anybody can do without any experience per se. That is one approach and that is the Abrahamic approach because it fits into the Abrahamic worldview of the, the infinite gap of man and God which is only bridged once or a few times through prophets and you have to study that history. The other view which we come from is that the, in, the ultimate knowledge is accessible in the embodied state. And the person who has experienced an embodied state is the one who has the adhikar. So this kind of uh, adhikar is not based on uh, a kind of an intellectual study uh, alone. So once I was in a discussion at Princeton University, they were in the 1990s, they were going to, they were looking for funds for uh, uh, Indian religions, you know, chairs. So I, they were telling me how they have this standard of uh, certain credentials have to be met for the person to be uh, brought in. So the person who is not credentialed according to the academy, no matter how much experience he has, is not qualified. So ask them, what if you had a chair on Buddhism and Buddha walked in and he doesn't have credentials, what would you do? Now, I thought they would think for a while, but very quickly they said, we reject. <laughs> very, very quickly. So I said, what about Jesus Christ who applied for a job on Christianity? And he doesn't have any credentials. And they said, we reject him. He cannot be teaching this. So this is a very serious issue. It is, not a, it is not a political issue that you can change. It's a theological, metaphysical issue of two civilizations having a very different metaphysical view on what constitutes authority. So when you prevent a person from being included in the discourse on grounds that he doesn't have the Western credentials, you're calling because you are submitting yourself to that, that particular uh, criteria of what constitutes authority. Yeah? So um, I have a lot more I can talk about. I'm writing a book on the colonization of the Dravidian identity and the Dalit identity in India and their Christianization. And uh, Dr. Shinde has seen that. It's a big 600 page book. It should come out in January. There is a further colonization of the Munda tribes uh, it's not only Aryans and Dravidians that are the issue now, but the, in central India, this whole Maoist thing has been stirred up because they've, they've created a new identity called the Munda identity, which is even more originally Indian than Dravidians. Mm -hmm. So it is not that Aryans came and Dravidians were local. The Aryans, the first, the Dravidians came and invaded the Mundas. Now this is the theory. The Mundas were the only original Indians. The Dravidians came from somewhere and invaded the Mundas. And then Aryans came and invaded both of them. So now the bad guys are both Aryans and also Dravidians. It's the Mundas who have to be empowered with a history, with a philosophy, with a theology, all of that. And this is kind of colonization which is right now very deep and Harvard has a big program, funded partly by the government also, uh, to do this Munda type studies and show a different uh, original thing. I'll, uh, I'll uh, conclude uh, by just saying that uh, uh, last night or the night before, uh, Subhash made a very interesting uh, co co comment that uh, uh, now things will change because we have a lot of very rich Indians and they believe in India and so we will get funding. And I think this is a common view which we all hope is the case. My feeling is this, the India that this new wealth people want is consists of pop culture, which is Bollywood, cricket, Shah Rukh Khan, Hamra, you know, nice pageantry party, this kind of thing. Uh, 
uh, what postmodernists would say is all kind of blends and we are all, you know, we can agree, everybody, no boundaries, all that stuff is pop culture. India is doing very well in that department. And the second thing is, uh, is secular materialism, the wealth creation, the stock market, the sensex values, the GDP 10% growing, all that kind of stuff. These two comprise their idea of India and they are funding that idea of India for sure. But a layer deeper than that, which is classical Indian civilization, they either don't know about, they don't want to know about, they think it may be irrelevant, they may even think, many of them think it's a problem, we have to get rid of that because that is primitive, that has caused us all these poverties. They bought into the colonial discourse. So I, when I go around talking to such people, and I know a lot of them very personally, uh, they are very reluctant to get, put their serious money into that deepest level of Indian civilization. So with that, I'll conclude and uh, we can discuss more of these questions. Thank you very much.